Good morning, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. It's great to be back with you again for our weekly chat. Hoping that this past week has been a blessed one for you and your loved ones, that you're all doing well, that you're staying safe, but more importantly, that you're taking time to be family together. This morning, as we move ever closer to our journey into the preparation Sundays of Great and Holy Lent, I think it's important that we sort of pause and take note of two upcoming feasts that precede that journey. First, the Feast of the Presentation of Our Lord on February the 15th on the Old Calendar, and then Zacchaeus Sunday, because both serve as signposts for our spiritual voyage as we move to our new target, entering the Great and Holy Lent. As always in our podcast, if you have any questions or comments, enter them into your, your, your phone or iPads or whatever, and I'll try to get them um, as soon as I can. So let's begin as usual with our prayer to the Holy Spirit, O Heavenly King. O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere and fillest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, Come and abide in us, and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, O good one. So, as the basis of our discussion this morning, I'm going to use a little book, wonderful book, uh, The Celebration of Faith, the Church Year, written by the late Dean of St. Vladimir's Seminary, Father Alexander Schmemann. And in his commentary on the meeting of the Lord, he writes, 40 days after Christmas, all parishes of the Orthodox Church celebrate the meeting of the Lord. And since it usually falls on a weekday, this feast is half forgotten. But nonetheless, this is when the Church completes the time of Christmas, revealing and recapitulating the full meaning of Christmas in a stream of pure and profound joy. Think about that for a second. So it's the 40 days after Christmas that we celebrate. Okay? The feast commemorates and contemplates an event recorded in the Gospel of St. Luke. 40 days after the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem, Joseph and Mary keeping to the religious practices of the time, brought the child Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it's written in the law of the Lord. The Gospel of Luke continues. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death until he had seen the Lord's Christ, the Messiah. And inspired by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, in other words, to be circumcised, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to your word. For mine eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory to your people, Israel. And Joseph and Mary marveled at what was said about Jesus. And Simeon blessed them, and then said to Mary, Jesus' mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is spoken against, and a sword shall pierce through your own soul also, and th that thoughts out of many hearts may be, be revealed. That's from the... Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 26 to 35. Now think about this for a second, dear, dear listeners. How striking and how beautiful an image. The old man holding the baby Jesus in his arms. How strange are his words. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Pondering these words, we begin to appreciate the depth of this event of the presentation of Christ and its relationship to us and to our faith. Is anything in the world more joyful than an encounter, a meeting with someone you love? Think about it. 
children who, who live out of town and come to visit you, brothers and sisters who you haven't seen for a while, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles. Um, I can remember growing up uh, when we were first married, how excited we were to be able to drive to, to both our, our parents' and in-laws' houses to celebrate different uh, feast days. Just the fact we would come together as family. The encounter, the anticipation of that encounter was wonderful. So truly, according to Father Schmemann, to live is to await, to look forward to an encounter. And isn't Simeon's transcendent and beautiful anticipation a symbol of this waiting? It is his long life, and he did live a long life, a symbol of expectation. This elderly man who spends his entire life waiting for the light which illumines all and the joy which fills everything with itself. Because that was the promise of God to him. And how unexpected, how unspeakably good that long-awaited light and joy comes to the elderly Simeon through a baby, through a child. Just imagine, dear listeners, the old man's trembling hands as he takes in his arms the 40-day-old child, so tenderly and so carefully, his eyes gazing on the tiny being and filling with an outpouring of praise. Lord, you may let me depart in peace, for I have seen, I have held in my arms, I have embraced the very meaning of life. Simeon waited. He waited his entire long life. And surely this means he pondered, he meditated, he prayed, he deepened as he waited, so that in the end, his whole life was one continuous eve of a joyful meeting. So, isn't it time to, that we ask ourselves, and I realize this is a very <clears throat> abstract, open-ended question, but I think it's important that we do so. You know, in our time during the day of meditating and thinking, <clears throat> isn't it time we ask ourselves, what am I waiting for? And no, the answer is not that COVID ends. We're talking spiritually here. What am I waiting for? What does my heart keep reminding me about more and more insistently? And speaking personally, I know as, as I grow older each day, more and more I'm starting to think about, you know, what the future holds for, for my soul. What can I do? to strengthen my soul. And I think, you know, this idea of what am I waiting for kind of needs to focus on, on, on that, that aspect. Is this life of mine gradually being transformed into anticipation, like St. Simeon's? As I look forward to encountering the essential, there's the key. As we look forward to encountering the essential, and what is the essential? I think we all know it in our minds, intellectually. But I think in the reality, in practicing that in life, we kind of forget about the essential aspects of life. And what are those essential aspects? To be drawn closer to Christ by our lifestyle, by prayer, by meditation, by holy confession, by receiving the body and blood of Christ. But more importantly, especially now in the time of the covid chaos, by reaching out to neighbors and those in need, by being able to satisfy their needs and not our own. Um, that is what is essential. That, is, that means we're doing Christ-like things in life. And the more Christ-like things we do in life, obviously, the more we can anticipate with joy and gladness. So these are some of the issues and questions that the Feast of the Presentation of Our Lord poses for us. Here in this feast, human life is revealed as the surpassing beauty of a maturing soul, increasingly freed, deepened, and cleansed of all that is petty, all that is meaningless, all that is incidental in daily lives. Even those of us who are aging and in declining years, the earthly destiny we all share are so simply and convincingly shown here to be growth, and to be an ascent toward that one moment when with all of our hearts 
in the fullness of thanksgiving, we can say, Lord, now let me just depart this world in peace. I have seen the light which permeates the world. I have seen the Christ child who brings the world so much divine love and who gives himself to me. And where is the Christ child, my dear loved ones? In each and every one of us. So we can see in our brothers and sisters in Christ. We can see in our neighbors. We can see in our family members that image and likeness of God that leads us to Christ. So in that perspective, nothing is feared. We should be afraid of nothing. Nothing is unknown to us because Christ reveals all. And everything is now peace. Everything is now thanksgiving. Everything becomes love. This is what the meaning, the meaning of the Feast of the Presentation of our Lord brings. It celebrates the soul. It celebrates the meaning of love. It celebrates the one who gives us life and gives us strength to transfigure it into living a life of anticipation. Okay. I, I kind of feel like we should stop there, but it's way too early. Let's keep moving here. Uh, so our next signpost that leads us into uh, the Great and, and Holy Lent and Preparation Sundays is the Sunday of Zacchaeus. Or as one of my parishioners said years ago, Oh yeah, Father, this is the Sunday of short people. To prepare us for Great Lent, the Orthodox Church starts announcing its approach a full month before it actually begins. How difficult it is for a person to understand that besides devotion to life's other innumerable preoccupations, there's also the care for the soul, for our inner world. If we're a bit more serious, we would see just how important, how essential, and how fundamentally important caring of the soul really is. In Matthew, we hear the Lord's words, Man shall not live by bread alone. Yet even those of us who take the time and the care and try to deal with the basic hygiene issues of life, we still need to focus on things to do for our soul. And that's why we, as we enter into the Lenten season and the preparation Sundays are before us, it's a time to kind of like re-examine, reappraise, sort of like wake ourselves up spiritually. The first announcement of Lent, then, the first reminder, comes through a very short gospel story about an entirely unremarkable man, small of stature, hint, hint, very short, whose occupation as a tax collector marked him in his village, in that time in society, as being greedy, as being cruel, as being dishonest. In the Gospel of Luke, we hear the, the, the narrative. Christ entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and very rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not on account of the crowd, because he was small of stature. So Zacchaeus ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up into the tree and saw Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus hurried down and received Christ joyfully. And when all the people saw that, they murmured, This man has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it to them fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. To see dear listeners and viewers, Zacchaeus wanted to see Christ. He wanted this so much his desire attracted the attention of Jesus. <clears throat> and that's the key. Desire in our hearts is the beginning of everything. The Gospel of Matthew says, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
Everything in our life begins with desire. Since what we desire is also what we love, what draws us from within, what we surrender to. We know that Zacchaeus loved money, and by his own admission, we know that to get it, he had no scruples about defrauding others. He was rich, and he loved riches. But within himself, he discovered another desire. He wanted something else. And this desire became the pivotal moment of life for him. So, the gospel story of Zacchaeus poses a question to each and every one of us. Very simple question. What do we desire? Not superficially, but deeply. There is no mysterious teacher walking through the town, walking down our street, knocking on our doors. But is that really so? Isn't there some mysterious calling walking by our life every moment? And somewhere in the depths of our soul, do we not sometimes feel longing for something other than what fills our days up from morning to, to evening? The answer, of course, is yes, there is. Stop for a moment, dear viewers. Pay attention. Enter our hearts. Listen to our own inner person. And we'll find within ourselves the very same strange and wonderful desire Zacchaeus encountered which no human being can live without, yet which almost everyone fears and suppresses with the noise and vanity of everything external. What does that mean? That means that, again, intellectually, we know how important it is to be spiritual, to be Christ-like. But that's a very fearful thing that requires us to change ourselves, to, to, to start with our own sinfulness, repent of that sinfulness, and try to change our life for the better, for our souls. That's really a difficult obstacle in our place. But here's the wonderful key to that. We're not alone in this battle. When we surrender ourselves to God, to Christ, to His grace, we're able to overcome anything in life, be it, be it sickness, be it... Uh, um, Poor health, be it uh, famine, be it pestilence, be it the COVID pandemic, whatever. But it starts with that, 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 that deep desire to, I want to change. I want to be what Christ wants me to be. Of course, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. There's an interesting picture that I'm sure you've all seen of Christ standing outside of a little hut, ready to knock on the door. And if you pay attention to the picture, there is no doorknob on the picture. Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, cannot open that door and walk in. The person inside, meaning, of course, the house symbolizes our soul, the person inside must open that house, that door, that soul, his soul, to Christ to receive him. He will not force himself in. We're not going to get mag magically zapped by, by the Holy Spirit to change and become Christ-like. We have to make that choice. And Zacchaeus did. He came down. Not only did he, did he feed Christ, he acknowledged his sinfulness and said, I will change. I will be better. So Zacchaeus Sunday is the first invitation of the church. The first imitation of the gospel that, that Christ is coming. That we should desire something else. That we should take a deep breath of something other than the daily life that we live. Remember something other than all the cares and worries of the world. And the very moment we stop to do that, we stop to listen and to focus on Christ in our hearts. Then we begin to see, as Achaeus did, that pure and joyful light that blows into our lives, that illumines our hearts. Desire. The soul taking a deep breath. Everything becomes, has already become, different, new, eternally meaningful. The little man Zacchaeus, with his eyes to the ground, focusing on earthly desires, now ceases to be little 
as his victory over himself begins. Here is the start, the first step from exterior to interior, toward that mysterious homeland which all of us desire. What is the homeland? To be in Christ forever. So that's it for today. I know there's a lot there. Thank God there is. I hope that this motivates all of us to see the great opportunity before us, to develop a willingness in our hearts, to open our heart and our minds to those important signposts coming up in our, in our life. The presentation of our Lord, the preparation Sundays into Great Lent, in the form of the feasts and important Sundays of the year that our Orthodox, Holy Orthodox faith sets before us and throughout the liturgical year. So let's close as usual with our prayer to the Most Holy Theotokos. Amen. the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Steadfast protectors of Christians, constant advocate before the Creator, do not despise the cry of us sinners, but in your goodness come speedily to help those who call upon you in faith. Hasten to our petition to intercede for us, O Theotokos, for we always protect those who honor you. My dear Viewers, thank you for taking the time to be with us. We love you. Know that we lift you all up in prayer. We ask that you pray for us as well. Because in lifting each other up in prayer, we are truly united in Christ. God bless.